Hope your Christmas was a great one. Um, we're going to do something a little bit scary today. Maybe scary for you. I'm going to preach two messages in one sitting. Please don't turn the video off. I promise you it won't go, uh, probably won't go as long as some of my other messages on here. Certainly will not go longer than normal. Find your way to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at uh, the first 11 verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. I titled this, Living in Readiness. Living Ready. And this is God's word. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this this one, we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, our dwelling, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but because we want to be further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. So your conscience says, um, why am I going to preach two messages? I hope you'll at least hang around to know what the second message is, because I want to give you a little advance warning. If you leave on the first one, you will leave deficient. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Um, thank you for teaching me. Uh, thank you for giving me a blessing to learn together with my church family and those that would tune in with this video and also to be able to share the things that you've taught me. We love you. We want to we want to be better disciples, Jesus. Will you help us and teach us in this today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to talk about three future blessings that believers have. So if you're listening and you're a believer, this is about you. This is your, your future. Three blessings. If you're listening and you're not a believer, hang in there. I do want to talk to you um, a little bit toward the end of this first message. So th three future blessings. How about this one? The joy of a new body. Now, it is easy to read the beginning of these verses and, and think that it's almost like John chapter 14, where Jesus says, you know, I'm going away. I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a great place for you in my father's house or many mansions or dwelling places. And, and I'm going to come and get you and take you to that great place there. It's easy to, to read this and think he's also talking about a house. But he's not talking about a house. He's talking about our bodies, the outward man that we've been talking about. So here Paul, as a tent maker, is using this picture of a tent to refer to our physical bodies. Now, just to follow along with that, he says, you know, if this our earthly house is destroyed, we have a building from God. He talks about clothing. But look at verse 6 where he says this, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Verse 8, we are confident, yes, well, pleased rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Again, in verse 10, one may receive the things done in the body. He's using this picture of a tent to picture this body that we live in right now. And a tent is a great picture. A tent is a simple, temporary structure to kind of get you through until you get home. Now, I may have just absolutely offended uh, some diehard campers, but listen, for the rest of us, a, temper, a tent is not the place we particularly want to be. We make do there. We're grateful for the blessing of it, but we're longing to get back home into the comfort of our full 
blessing. And here Paul says, we have a real body in our home in heaven. He's talking, kind of looking forward to this resurrection, glorified body that believers will have. And he describes it here. He talks about verse one, this building, this body is from God that we're going to have one day. He also says it is not made with hands. And that's kind of strange because this body wasn't made with human hands. Um, what he's talking about is this body is made for this place and from this place. If you boil my body down to its basic elements, it's the same elements you'll find in the dirt, just as Genesis said, that God formed us from the clay of the ground. When he talks about a body not made with hands, he's talking about not a temporal body. It's going to be a body made for eternity. And that's the distinction there. It won't be lacking anything, he says here. And he goes on to paint the picture, kind of the contrast between those two bodies, our earthly body and our heavenly body. And he says, in this body, we groan. And he's not talking about, oh, my back or, oh, my hip. When the weather gets bad, my hip starts acting up. He's talking about this groaning, this longing for more. It, it's innate in every person in this world that we, we find ourselves longing for something more. And we, we can never find it. We think we find it. We think we're going to find it in money. Guess what? You don't find it in money. We can find it in fame or in power or in stuff coming off Christmas time. Or if you get enough stuff, you'll finally stop groaning and longing for more. No, give it a shot. You'll never get there. And maybe you know people who are a very picture and illustration of it. No matter how much they have, there's this constant groan from all of humanity. What a joy here to know in this passage that the groaning of this old tent is just a temporary groan and that the body that God has for me there is perfect and it is absolutely fulfilled. And again, in verse one, he says it is eternal in the heavens. Are you ready for that body? Man, I am ready for that body. I like verse four. Paul says, for we who are in this tent groan being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed. He said, we're not just trying to ditch this body. We're groaning because we want to be further embodied. We want to be further clothed. That mortality might, swall might be swallowed up by life, that our constant progress toward death might be swallowed up to eternal Life. Paul's speaking into a, a culture that was driven by a philosophy that maybe you haven't heard of. It was this philosophy that says the body is bad, but the soul is good. All people, they would think that. All people have a bad body, an evil, sinful body, and a good uh, soul. And if we could just get rid of the body, everything would be okay. Um, that is absolutely not true. And Paul is speaking into that culture, just trying to clarify uh, that thing. We don't want to be simply unclothed. We want to be further clothed with eternal life. Verse 5 is also glorious. I didn't want to pass by that one. He who has prepared us, past tense, for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Did you know that this has been God's plan all along? Past tense, he has prepared us for this temporary tent dwelling and a coming, glorious, eternal, fulfilled body. He's prepared us for that. And he has prepared believers for this glory. I'm going to read to you from Romans 8. Um, maybe you know Romans 8, 28 and 30. It says this, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. In other words, declared them to be right with God through Christ. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What that, I've not yet been glorified, but in the mind of God, he already has established that. Because, because I'm trusting in his son and I have been called to him through the gospel and responded in faith, it's already been settled that I am glorified in his presence, even though I'm waiting for that yet to occur. It's already been established. 
What a glorious truth is that? For all the questions we have, what's going to happen next year? What's going to happen in 2021? I don't know what's going to happen in 2021, but I know what's going to happen when all is said and done. I'm going to be glorified with my Father and with the Lord Jesus in heaven in a perfect new body forever and ever. And I'm not going to make toilet paper um, with little baby angels on fat clouds. I'm going to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords forever. Who knows what he's going to be doing if he did all of this in our lifetime, in this world, in this little speck of the earth, in all of the universe. What else is he doing? And if I know this much about him now and its glory, what else will I learn about him in the future as I walk with him? That's amazing. The joy of a new body. I just stopped talking. I'm going to get, I'm going to get too far ahead of myself here. But notice also in that verse five, he does say the Holy Spirit is given to us as a guarantee. You say, how do you know, Jason, that you're going to have all of that stuff? Well, I know that because God's given a deposit. He's given a guarantee, a deposit that guarantees that in me. And it is the Spirit of God. This Spirit of God that brings to my mind and my remembrance the things that Jesus spoke. This Spirit of God that convicts me. This Spirit of God that guides me and leads my life and leads me on this course that takes me to Hayes, Kansas from for a North Carolina boy. That Spirit of God that moves me to worship and moves me toward holiness, He's the guarantee, and I know He's there. That means I know that I'm going to be with God in a new body one day. The joy of a new body. Second beautiful future blessing here. How about the joy of a new location? Verses 6 through 8. Here's two sure truths that we get in verses 6 through 8. Verse 6, while we are in this tent, we are absent from the Lord. That's one truth. While we're in this tent, we're absent from the Lord. Now, is that really true? Uh, I know that it's true because scripture just told me that, but just thinking logically, am I really absent from the Lord? Um, in one sense, I'm not absent from the Lord, right? Uh, Paul constantly tells believers that we're in Christ and Christ is in us. Uh, Jesus promised his people when he commissioned us for uh, service to be witnesses to him. He said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, so even here, even now, he's with us. Listen, those things are true, and Paul's not contradicting that at all. What he's talking about is the very physical, visual presence of the Lord, and that becomes clear in verse 7. He says, for we walk now by faith. I enjoy Jesus now by faith, but I don't get to see him. I don't get to, uh, like Mary, throw my arms around his feet and cling to him. I don't get to eat with him. One day I'll eat with him. Marriage supper of the lamb. I'll eat with him. I can't do that today. So by sight, in the physical presence of the Lord, we're not there yet. Um, second sure truth. As long as we're in this tent, we're absent from the Lord. But the second truth is in verse 8. When believers are absent from this tent, where are we? We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So there's the second truth. I get asked with some consistency, where do we go when we die? Believers asking that, where do we go when we die? And the question is coming kind of from this background. Do we lay in, a, do we lay in the ground um, and sleep until the Lord Jesus comes? We call that soul sleep. And a lot of people kind of have that notion or believe that. But listen, this passage totally removes any notion of an intermediate state between here and there, between living in this body and living with Jesus. There is no soul sleep, even while we're waiting for our resurrection bodies. Think about it. What did Jesus tell the thief on the cross? Today, you will go to sleep for thousands of years. And then one day, thousands, millennia from now, I'll come for you. No, what did he say? Today, you will be with me, with me in paradise. Wow, what a blessing. What about believers that are saved and killed during the tribulation? I want to be careful how I say that. They're saved and killed in the tribulation, which they will be systematically uh, martyred in the, in the tribulation time. The Bible shows us that. In Re Revelation chapter 6, there are a bunch of brand new believers in the tribulation saved. How? 
the Bible. Um, 144,000 Jews that are preaching Jesus as Messiah. Uh, the testimony that maybe we've left behind. There are people that are saved and they are very quickly martyred. And then we instantly in chapter 6 see them in the presence of God, talking to God. How, how long, they say, how long before you will um, make right what just went wrong down there? Because that was not fun. <laughs> how long? So they're there in the presence of God talking immediately. What a blessing. What a truth. There is no soul sleep. There is no purgatory. If we are absent from this body, we are believers present with the Lord, period. That's good news. I love that. Are you ready for that? I have never seen him, but I love him. And again, the, the few things that I know of his glory now and, and, the, and the few ways that I know him are amazing. Can you imagine what it'll be like when we know him as well as he knows us? Wow, Paul's deepest desire, in fact, he says, I, I count every other thing in this world as rubbish to gain that one thing, to know him, not to be, just to know him. Can you imagine what that'll be like to be in his presence? There we will perfectly know him and we will be in his place with him. Are you ready for that? The third joy is a joy of reward. And we see that in verses 9 and verses 10. Not only are you and I going to have a new eternal glorified body, not only are we going to be with him in the presence of the Lord Jesus, but heaven will also be a place of great reward. Verse 9 says, therefore, in other words, knowing all of that, that we're going to be blessed in that way, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, so whether here serving or away from this body and with him, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, we believers, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We, knowing that we're going to be there with him, we make it our aim, our goal, to be pleasing to him everywhere, now in this body or there in his presence. We believers make it our goal to obey him. And then he says that other part, all of us must appear at the judgment seat of Christ. That's, it kind of sounds scary. If I'm going to the judgment seat, I, had, I was called into court some time ago um, to be a, a character reference uh, for some, I didn't do anything, but to be a character reference. And I, said, I was nervous. I wasn't on trial. <laughs> I was just speaking on behalf of somebody, but I was nervous. It's kind of a scary thought to be on the judgment seat of Christ. It sounds like we're going to be judged for our sins there. Look down. I want you to look all the way down on my page. It's at the bottom of that same page. Chapter 5, verse 21. And it says that, For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The judgment seat of Christ is not a place where I'm going. To, my sins are going to be judged, and I might have to pay some huge penalty there, or I might be condemned. Paul, this same Paul, writes, "There, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus." I will never be judged for my sin because all of my sin was judged on the cross. Jesus was judged for all of my sins on the cross. And there's no condemnation written in this passage here. Just the truth that we believers will stand before Jesus to give an account of what we've done as his disciples. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is mentioned here. It's mentioned in Romans 14, mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3, which we're going to read in a minute. And it is only for the redeemed, the saved, and only for the testing of our works for reward. But it says there, at the end of verse 10, it says that we would receive whatever is done in the body, whether good or bad. That sounds like sin and punishment. If I've done bad and I'm receiving for it, that sounds bad. The, these, this is not a word here for moral evil. In fact, neither one of these words are about moral good or moral evil. There are two words more commonly translated for moral evil, which is kakos and poneros. And this is not that word. This is phallos. And phallos doesn't mean moral evil. It means worthless or 
unprofitable. And same thing is true of the word uh, used for good here. It means profitable or worthy. So this judgment is a judgment where we, he will be evaluating the things that we've done worthy of his kingdom and his name and those things that were not worthy or were useless for his kingdom and his name. This is not new news to these Corinthians he's writing to. In fact, he already wrote about this in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. I want to read that. He says here, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm going to read in verse 10, according to the grace that of God that was given to me as a wise master builder, I have, Paul, laid the foundation and others build on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. How could you build on it? You could build on it in worthy ways or unworthy ways. So listen, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day. What day? The day of the judgment seat of Christ. We'll declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. That sounds painful. It, if anyone's work which he has done, built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. That's the gold, silver, precious stones, worthy of the kingdom stuff. If anyone's work is burned or it doesn't pass the test, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. So it's not pain. This is testing of works, not fire on my body. The things that are worthy, I get a reward for. The things that are unworthy or unprofitable for the kingdom that I've given myself to on this earth, I will suffer loss of reward for those. I won't be rewarded for those things. So this is a beautiful thing. This is a, a blessing of reward in the kingdom of God. Loss of reward if we've been unworthy, but not condemnation. Now, what kind of reward do we get? I don't know. I don't know. Um, Ed McMahon won't be giving it away. I promise you that. Um, I think my best understanding of Scripture would say the rewards would be proximity to Jesus and service. How would I be? How would he allow me to be a part of what he's doing for the rest of this world, for the rest of eternity? I think that's the reward. So listen, uh, glorify the three blessings, right? The glorified body that is fulfilled, that doesn't long the way we long now. The physical presence of the Lord and eternal rewards. Are you ready? What a, what a great message. What a great future for those who are in Christ. And let me say this, and I mentioned to you earlier, if you're not in Christ, the only other option. Uh, you're going to be in judgment before God. You're either going to be at the great, the, the judgment seat of Christ, which is a place where we're rewarded for worthy, faithful acts, or you're going to be at the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter, talked about in Revelation chapter 20. It's also a judgment of works, but in that judgment, he's going to have a book, which is just a way of picturing all the things that you've done, good and evil, that he knows about, and he's going to look through those works, and he's going to judge you based on that. Now, don't, don't get too caught up in this. Some people are going to be as evil as you can get. They're going to be tilted as that, that way that far, evil as you can get. Other people are not going to be quite so evil. They're going to do a lot of good things. Some people are going to do quite a few good things and not as many evil things. Nobody's going to be righteous. Why do I know that? Because the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? But listen, he's going to weigh you out and he's going to show you exactly where you were. And then he's going to open, the Bible says in Revelation 20, a second book, and it's the, the Lamb's book of life. And it's the book that lists out a way of picturing God's perfect knowledge of who is and who ain't. It's going to be listed out there. Did this person come to, to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior? Because they all fell short, all of them. Did they come? And the answer is no, they did not. And so listen, it doesn't matter whether you're as evil as you could possibly be, uh, somewhat better than that, or maybe a pretty good person and, and you've not done so many things terribly wrong. The Bible's going to say, but the sins that you committed, did you turn to Jesus for those? And the answer in every one of those cases is no. 
And he says, depart from me. And it's to hell. It's to eternal separation from God. That judgment is going to make very clear that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you know what that means? If you're a lost person, you don't have to be a serial killer to go to hell. You have to have rejected the only hope that you have for what sin you have committed, and every one of us have it. And if you have rejected the only hope that you have for salvation, the Bible says you would be eternally separated from God. God has no joy in that. Uh, we're not going to be in heaven laughing at you. We're going to be, we're going to be rejoicing in the grace of Jesus Christ. But listen, if you're lost, know this: that today the grace of Jesus Christ is extended to you. That today you could repent, you could turn away from this thinking and living that says, I'm my own daggone boss and I'll do what I want to do and I'll, I'll tell me what's right for me. and what's right. You could turn from that and instead trust in Jesus Christ, who he is, the son of God, what he's done, paid for your sin debt in the full on the cross, raised up to give you a new life. If you repent and you believe, trust in Jesus, and then you, it, would, it would change everything change your life. It would change your wants. It would change your will. And you will begin like we are this process of growing to know him, to love him and to be more like him. And you will be progressing to this reward that we talk about here. If that is you, please contact me. Please ask somebody you know about Jesus, about being saved. Please just pray and say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm a mess. I may not be the biggest mess, but I am a mess, and I need Jesus. He's my only hope. Will you, will you walk with me? Will you forgive me, and will you walk with me and help me to grow? And then I'd say, go find a church and start learning what he says. Start learning what he says. Now, that's sermon number one. Sermon number two is real quick. Everything that I've just preached is true, to the best of my understanding. I've not misrepresented anything. I, I would never knowingly do that. But I want to tell you that at this point, to this point, I have still been a pretty poor preacher if I stopped where I stopped. And here's why. Because I have absolutely failed to connect this good news with the reason that it's here, which is some hard news. And in failing to do that, I've fallen way short of what you needed to hear. One of the greatest dangers in preaching is this pull to give people only good news. Um, every pastor wants people to come to church. Every pastor wants people to recognize the value of the church and the value of the Bible. And here's the thing, a hard message, a hard message seems to work against both of those things. Because, you know, if I, man, if I preach a hard message, people won't want to come to church. If I preach a message that... Uh, kind of, kind of puts pressure on people in some way or, or shows them something negative that they may not want to see. Man, they wouldn't see the value of coming to our church or of, of reading this Bible. A hard message challenges those things. So listen, there's this constant gravity-like pull to only preach positive, encouraging things. I call that the K-Love factor. K-Love, um, I don't even know if we get that around here. K-Love is a station, their motto, it's a Christian station, they play great music, and their motto is positive, encouraging K-Love. You're not going to hear anything negative here. You're not going to hear anything that's not positive and encouraging here. It's the K-Love factor. And I said it's a danger because when we only declare what is positive and encouraging, we fail to declare things. And I cheated a little earlier. We fail to declare things like repentance. That's not positive and encouraging. I don't want to be told I have to change things or turn around for my present. We fail to teach things about dying to ourself, to follow the Lord Jesus. Oh, that's too costly. I don't want to do that. Just give me a free gift. I don't want to have to do anything. No, we have to die and deny ourselves. We, we fail to teach about moral truth, moral absolutes. Are you kidding me? There's absolute morality in this. I don't want any part of that. I had somebody tell me that the other week, probably six weeks ago. I don't want any, I don't want any part of that. I want to do what I want to do. If we teach those kinds of things, we're not giving people the positive only, the encouraging 
only. We fail also to prepare people for suffering. We fail to prepare people for the spiritual warfare that's really going on around us. We fail to prepare people for the reality of the wear and tear uh, that we receive from ministry. But if there is one type of preaching that protects us from this pull, this gravity pull to preach only positive, encouraging things, it is expository preaching. It's preaching that goes through books of the Bible. And that's what I try to do. And the reason that's a blessing and a protection is because I can't skip the hard stuff. If I tell you we're going to preach through 2 Corinthians, that means I have to preach the sunshine and I have to preach the pits. I have to preach it all to myself and to you. I can't hide from the hard sections. Uh, I, I can't skip the sections that aren't Caleb factor, positive and encouraging stuff. I can't hide from hard context. And that means that I have to hear it and you have to hear it. But from the, for the pastor who kind of bounces around from, I'm going to use some Southern lingo on you, from sugar stick to sugar stick. What the heck's a sugar stick? That's that kind of feel good message where everything's great. Nom, 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 sugar stick. Some pastors, and I know a lot of them, who do, they just jump from sugar stick to sugar stick. And those folks, the church may hear good messages, the church may hear true messages, but they will absolutely miss the point of a lot of those passages. Today, I did just that. In the first message, I preached pretty much a sugar stick kind of message. It was true, but I failed to connect to the context that was hard. So what's the context that changes the tone of this passage? I was joking. I really don't need to preach a second sermon to you because it's everything that we've been talking about for weeks building up to this. If you've been listening each week, we've been walking through the context. That's why expository preaching is so protective. It's what you've been hearing for weeks. Why is Paul here talking about this joy of a new body? You know the answer to that because he's losing his current body. Why? Because, listen, he's hard-pressed from every side. He's confused. He's being persecuted. He's literally being struck down. Why? For the gospel ministry. He's, he is a clay jar carrying the precious treasure of the gospel, and he has taken some beatings for it. And he is showing it in his scarred, marred body. And remember his point. He said last time, I will never, ever give up on the gospel ministry because I trust God for my future. And so here he's just carrying on that, that, that statement. I trust God for a new body when a broken world breaks this one. I trust God for a home with him when I lose this one, this body. I'm living in such a way to please him because I know before long I'm going to be with him through death. And I trust God to reward me for the things that I've done that are worthy of his gospel. And I trust that there will be no comparison between the things that I've suffered here and the glory that he is giving me in the kingdom. And listen, that redefines the discussion of the judgment seat of Christ there at the end. How much of my life is consumed with activities and pursuits that are unworthy of the commission that he's given me to be a gospel witness in this world? How many of my works like that will be burned up unworthy when he inspects me that day? And yet in this first message, I said nothing about the gospel ministry that you've been commissioned to. But I want to leave you with this thought today. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, And now, little children, that's me and you. That's not the kids group. That's me and you. Now, little children, abide in him. And that is a rich word. Walk with him. Know him. Serve him. Lean on him. Abide in him like a branch abides in the vine. Abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him. This is a judgment seat of Christ kind of statement here. Abide in him, be faithful, be wor live a, a life worthy of the commission he's given you so that you will have confidence and not be ashamed. Believe it or not, some believers will be saved and be ashamed at his coming. 
And I'm not trying to say that they're going to live their eternal life in heaven in shame. I mean that when they see him, they are going to be ashamed because they thought the Christian life was just about going to church and then heaven someday. They did little to nothing with the gospel. And listen, many people think that because they're fed sugar stick preaching all of their Christian life. They think that because in our pursuit to give them positive and encouraging, we never told them anything different about what's expected of them as a follower of Jesus Christ. We skip the whole Luke 9, 23 thing that says, if you would come after me, then deny yourself and take up your cross daily. That's an ugly picture. Oh, it's the most joyful picture in the world. Ask Paul, ask a, a, a saint that you know that serves Jesus uh, diligently. But it's a hard one. People believe that because that's what they're told. You deserve better than that. You deserve to hear the context of God's word, the truth of it, the whole truth of it. I deserve to hear that. Um, I grew, I have a lot of examples in my past. Not everybody in my past. I've had some precious pastors who've spoken into my life. But I've had plenty of examples in my life of just, I got to give you positive and encouraging so you'll come back. That's all I can give you so you'll come back. I have been well trained in that sense and how to do this. And I know that preachers do this because I can look back at some of my messages early on and I did it. I did it. I remember going back to my first church and I still love those people with all of my heart today. I remember going back there for a homecoming to re-preach a message that I just so totally flubbed up because I wanted to be positive and encouraging. And I went back at homecoming and I preached the truth of that message. And it was just... For me, it was redeeming a mess, uh, redeeming a mess. And it may be that one day I get rewarded for that second sermon, whereas that first one would have been burned up and I would have gotten nothing out of it. It's one thing about the end of this passage, and this is the other thing that I did wrong in the first message. I, didn't, I never touched chat, uh, verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. That's not positive and encouraging, you know? Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust we are well known in your consciences. That's a gospel focus ending. If the redeemed will stand under the holy gaze of Jesus to be tested at the judgment seat of Christ, can you imagine the terror of the Lord for unbelievers? That is an ugly picture. We ought to know that full well in our mind, and it ought to be part of what drives us to persuade men to listen to the gospel and to respond in faith. Now, I don't want to suggest that every pastor that preaches kind of bounce around passage here, bounce around passage there, are bad. Some of the best preachers that I hear are not necessarily through the book pastors, preachers, but here's what distinguishes them. They study this text to know the context, and they exposit this passage well. It is so easy to just sermonize a text and make it sound good and skip over a bunch of stuff. And if you're not a discerning listener, you won't notice that. But again, I will say this. My church family deserves better than that, and they deserve to be trained one week at a time to understand the context of the Bible as a whole. And what I feel like will happen is that they will be able to spot a sugar stick in a second. Now, I love positive messages, and the Bible's full of them. But there's full of all the other things, too, that I desperately need to hear. And I think our church will be absolutely trained to spot an empty sugar stick when they hear one. And I hope you will as well. Are you living for the gospel, even in the process of taking wear and tear on yourself in doing it? Are you risking for the gospel as much as is necessary? Are you making others ready to do the same by persuading men with the gospel? And again, are you counting the costs and continuing to move ahead 
because you trust Jesus? I hope so. I want to pray with us and we'll be we'll close this video. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for this passage. Uh, Lord, thank you for the positive and the good news here. There's lots of it in this past whole sermon's worth. Uh, but Lord, there is also this incredible context that we've been pouring through that ministry costs and that it is worth every bit of it. Uh, will you continue to raise us up to be faithful in the things that we do? Thank you, Lord, that I will stand before you one day and I will not stand before you one day to, to, to face possible condemnation. Um, you have given me the Holy Spirit. By, by faith in your son, I have received that. You've given it to me. Uh, but Lord, I want to be—I want to be ready for that day, and I want—I um, want much to be rewarded for that. I have much to throw back at your feet, and honor and to glorify you with. I pray for that for me and for our listeners in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in with us. See you back next week.